Good afternoon, everybody. You're all very welcome indeed to the Irish Institute for International and European Affairs in Dublin. My name is John O'Brennan. I'm delighted to host today's event, and we are delighted to welcome our guest speaker, Professor Michael Ignatia. In a moment, I'll formally uh, introduce Michael just before I do a word on the format for today's event. Um, the Michael will speak to us for about 20 minutes or so. After that, we're going to have plenty of time for questions and answers. If you would like to ask a question of Michael, you just have to use the Q&A function on Zoom, and I will then relay those questions to Michael. Um, a reminder that today's event is on the record. That is both the uh, contribution from Michael and the Q&A. And so to introduce our guest speaker, Michael Ignatieff needs little introduction. He is professor of history at the Central European University in Vienna. For his sins, a former politician. Um, more recently, he was rector of the Central European University in Budapest. And there is hardly anybody thus better placed to talk about today's theme of illiberal democracy and why it matters for university, for free speech, and so on. Michael has such a distinguished record as an academic. Some of the books that he wrote in earlier phases of his career are books that I still read and use. I teach ethnic conflict, for example, and I use that wonderful book, Blood and Belonging, which he wrote in the mid 1990s. Another book, The Lesser Evil, which focuses on political ethics and why they matter. His latest book on consolation, Finding Solace in Dark Times. So we are delighted truly to welcome Michael to the Institute. And I look forward to hearing what he has to say about this hugely important topic. And I invite him now to take the floor, Michael. Thank you, John. Uh, it's uh, great to be in Dublin, even uh, kind of digitally. Uh, it's one of my favorite cities. Um, I'd also like to give a little shout out to Irish diplomacy, if I can. Um, uh, Ireland beat Canada to a seat on the Security Council, and that came as a mighty big shock in Ottawa, but uh, I want to raise my hat to the skill and sophistication of Ireland's representative representation overseas. You also got some terrific representatives in Central and Eastern Europe. And I don't know whether Ambassador Pat Kelly, who is your ambassador in Hungary, is watching. But if he is, thank you. You were a great friend to the university and, and a tremendous representative of Ireland. So let, let me get to the topic at hand a liberal democracy and threats to academic freedom in Europe. I mean, I guess I have three questions. One is, why did the Eastern European transition as a whole end up in illiberal democracy in at least two places? Why did a liberal democracy then target universities? And what does the future hold for democracy in Central and Eastern Europe? Let's go back to the transition, first of all, in 1989. The transition was supposed to do kind of three things. It was supposed to move from closed to open societies, and that meant open markets, uh, open borders, free markets, and uh, a free press. It also meant secondarily <clears throat> a political transition from single party police states to multi-party political competition. And the third geostrategic implication was in some ways the most important, which was to move the whole region from alignment with the Soviet empire into alignment with EU and NATO. And by 2004, as you know, that realignment was complete. Eastern Europe was in the European Union. And so then the question becomes, why did enlargement not consolidate liberal democracy in that region? I think there are a couple of reasons why not. One of them is the simple weight of political culture in the region, the authoritarian heritage. In Hungary, you know, it's not just Qatar and the Communist Party after 56 or from 45 onwards. 
It's also Admiral Horthy in the 20s and 30s and 40s, a deeply anti-Semitic authoritarian uh, regime. <clears throat> it's Pilsudski in Poland, it's Tito in former Yugoslavia. These are, these are, this is a region with a deep experience of single party rule led by a single, single strong man. Um, that's one heritage. The other heritage is even in some ways more disturbing, and that's the heritage of ethnic cleansing. Um, you know, 600,000 Hungarian Jews are exterminated uh, between uh, spring 1944 and, and summer 1944. Um, terrible uh, ethnic cleansing in, in Poland and in also in the former Yugoslavia. So these countries come out of the war in 1945, having had their pluralistic uh, culture eradicated by Hitler or by Stalin. And so they become um, monoethnic uh, states with essentially a monoethnic uh, political culture. That is a culture that's not habituated to accommodating um, uh, plural, pluralism, ethnic and religious difference. Um, I think another reason why the transition doesn't go right has to do with the failure of the transition elites themselves. I mean, CEU was formed in 1991 to train that transition elite. They're the people who wrote the new constitutions. They're the people who privatized the economy. They're the people who set up multi-party democracy. But by uh, 2005 and 2006, many of these transition elites were A, too small to consolidate themselves into a permanent ruling bloc, and I think they also um, had become uh, corrupt and were therefore vulnerable to a, an attack from the right wing. One of the things that happened during the whole transition that people didn't see at the time was the emergence of a new counter elite. Um, the transition elites were based in, the, in, you know, in Warsaw, in, in, in Belgrade, in, in uh, uh, Budapest. The counter elites were based in the countryside, small town, conservative, unilingual, most of them didn't speak any other language but their own, deeply anti-cosmopolitan by instinct, and Christian, Catholic, Protestant, um, by, uh, by uh, allegiance. <clears throat> and this counter elite uh, begins to take uh, the, uh, the possibility of taking power, and uh, parties like Fidesz from Hungary, Orban's political formation, basically build their political support on this new uh, counter elite. When the counter elite um, begins to mobilize politically, um, it mobilizes on a kind of politics of resentment. One of the things that comes as a really disagreeable surprise, I think, to people who believe in uh, EU enlargement, was how quickly that counter elite, national elite, began to resent the um, uh, resent Brussels. And so, to a degree that must astound uh, people in Ireland. Uh, there are people in Poland, there are people in Hungary who talk without apparent irony of Brussels being the new Moscow. Uh, what these counter elites don't like is that um, EU enlargement constrains the political systems and the sovereignty of these uh, counter elites. And so they, <coughs> they don't like it. Um, so instead of building a consensus in favor of incorporation in a new European project, EU enlargement present tremendously strong resentment by local elites who didn't like the abridgment of their power. Another factor, I think, which needs to be emphasized is how tough capitalism was when it came to Eastern Europe. One, one example is the ways in which Austrian and Swiss banks sold mortgages denominated in euros or in the Swiss currency to unsuspecting uh, Hungarians uh, who then had never had a mortgage before and suddenly had were paid in forints and had to pay them back in um, uh, European currencies and quickly went underwater. And the crisis that this engendered in the financial crisis of 2008 and 2009 is a central reason why uh, Fidesz came to power. They ran as a kind of anti-capitalist nationalist program that said, you've been screwed, excuse my language, by the Western banks. We're going to take back control and make sure none of you go underwater. And this was something I think the transition elites were slow 
to realize and, 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 and respond to. When these counter elites take power and they, Fidesz takes power in 2010, they took power in the name of the people. But the people they were talking about were themselves, the counter elite. And they immediately used political power and the legitimacy of majority rule to mount a major attack on counter-majoritarian institutions. Counter-majoritarian institutions include the courts, the media, regulatory uh, agencies, and uh, the universities. We're not used, by the way, to thinking of universities as part of the constitution of a liberal democracy, but I do think they need to be thought of in that way uh, as one of the countervailing counter-majoritarian powers that tries above all to keep the trade in ideas as honest as, as it can be. Um, this is what a liberal democracy amounts to, the use of majoritarian majority rule uh, to attack the counter majoritarian limits on power in the name of we the people, in the name of these ethnically homogeneous Hungarian, Polish, Serbian nations. Uh, there was less of this in the Czech Republic, partly because the Masarykian interwar tradition was stronger, um, the Catholic Church was less strong, and the economy was more deeply and successfully integrated into the German economy. So it's not a pattern across the whole, whole of the region, but this illiberal democratic trend begins to take hold, and democracy itself uh, begins to be uh, distorted. All of these trends which begin before the migration crisis are exacerbated, of course, by the migration crisis of 2015, when suddenly there are a million desperate um, Afghans, Syrians, um, um, people from the Middle East at the railway station in Kelaty and in Budapest, flooding onto trains to get through to Austria and then to Germany. Um, and this is a pivot crisis, which I think accentuates and radicalizes all of these parties across uh, the region. Um, Monoethnic states that had been uh, turned monoethnic by ethnic cleansing in, uh, in under Hitler and Stalin simply don't have any cultural idea of uh, a multicultural society that could absorb refugees. The right-wing parties immediately understand this, and Orban and Kaczynski and the Czechs and the Serbs all build a new ideological uh, base uh, to hold their support on the basis of opposition to mass migration from Muslim countries. Um, they not only do that, but they then turn migration into a sinister liberal cosmopolitan plot in which Western Europe wants to impose its multi-ethnic model on an Eastern Europe with different cultural traditions. It's a liberal cosmopolitan plot fueled by sinister uh, capitalist forces like George Soros and other well-funded liberals who want to impose a multicultural society of mass immigration on societies that have never had that experience. So it's a threat to the nation, it's a threat to the language, it's a threat to the survival of these countries. I think it's impossible to overstate how useful the migration crisis was in tuning up this, this ideology. It's in this period that my university, the CEU, comes under attack. Uh, CEU was founded by George Soros, and as part of Orban's election campaign in 2018, he decides to go after um, this transition institution. We were there to help in the transition. We become an internationally recognized graduate school in the social sciences. If you allow a 30 second straight pitch, we'd love to see more Irish students at the university. It's a great place to do serious advanced research and get a good master MA, end of, end of publicity uh, pitch. Um, but the university was the best university in Hungary. Orban attacks it as a symbol of this liberal cosmopolitan plot against the national integrity of Hungary. We fought it. Uh, it's important to remember that the height of the crisis, 80,000 people marched past our doors chanting 
free universities in a free society. So you mustn't come out of this talk thinking Orban speaks for every Hungarian or uh, Kaczynski speaking for every poll. There's substantial opposition inside these societies to the trends I'm describing, but we decided we couldn't fight uh, a government in perpetuity. And so that's why I'm now talking to you from Vienna and the university has gone from strength to strength and is now in, now in Vienna. Um, the, the, this revolution that Orban has led since 2010 uh, has become steadily more radical, uh, despite the fact that the European Court of Justice pronounced the expulsion of CEU illegal under uh, European law. Uh, Orban has basically effectively ignored the ruling and um, having thrown uh, a liberal university accredited in the United States out of Hungary. He's now brought in a new Chinese university from Fudan. Uh, and so you have uh, a new university, which whatever else it's going to do, will not teach um, <laughs> empirical uh, assessment of either the Chinese or the Hungarian regime <clears throat> in its classroom. So, and this entry of a Chinese university into a European member state is a source, I think, of some legitimate uh, concern and gives us a pointer to where uh, Eastern Europe as a whole may be going uh, in, in the future. Um, I, I want to I, I also focus on the ideological construct that illiberal democracy amounts to. Um, it's nationalist, it's conservative, it's Christian, it's anti-liberal, and so attacks on uh, gender studies, gay rights, um, the equation by the regime scandalously of um, um, teaching people about homosexuality in schools has been banned because that is equated with, get this, pedophilia. I mean, unbelievable stuff. Um, this construct is... Um, uh, not now just an Eastern European phenomenon. Um, uh, American conservatives are trekking to, uh, up to Budapest to see uh, Viktor Orban, <clears throat> Vice President Pence, various um, right-wing commentators, um, because this ideological construction of uh, majoritarian democracy, nationalist, conservative, Catholic, anti-gay, anti-gender equality, um, anti-migration um, is, it seems to me, the new face of 21st century right-wing conservatism. And as a liberal, what is interesting to me is that this is a conservatism unlike the conservatism uh, that we have seen um, in the 20th century. The conservatism, if I dare say so, of de Valera, then the conservatism of Adenauer, the conservatism of de Gasperi, the conservatism of Churchill, were all constitutional. And in a sense, <laughs> if reluctantly open to the world, this is a new kind of conservatism. And therefore, it's of interest, I think, to, to, to you, because it's not simply now confined to Central and Eastern Europe. It's gone global. Um, one of the other features of this authoritarian conservatism is that it doesn't treat liberals as adversaries, but as enemies. And it treats politics not as a battle of ideas, but as a combat to the death. Um, it accepts no limits to the authority of, uh, of its leader. And it's a threat to democracy because it models politics as a battle to the death because it treats its enemies, its opponents as enemies. And because in some sense, and this is the issue with Orban, it may not be able to, to allow itself to lose. Uh, Hungary faces an election in May, 2022. And the critical issue is whether he will accept a uh, democratic verdict uh, in which he loses power. Um, and so uh, whether, um, Orban will accept democratic defeat is at this moment uncertain. Um, it's easy to think uh, that all of this is very far away from, from Ireland, but this is a direct threat to the, to the geostrategic bet that Ireland has made since it entered the 
European Union. There, there is no more passionate European, pro-European state than Ireland in many ways, because you've done so well under the EU. But the EU is now, I think, genuinely threatened by this stubborn, relentless um, uh, resistance of Poland and Hungary to the basic norms of, of, um, of, of a liberal democratic state. And it's saturated with hypocrisy. Uh, Orban runs against, uh, against Brussels Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and cashes the EU checks, your taxpayers' dollars and euros on Saturday and Sunday. But the opposition to European integration by these regimes is, is existential because they're essentially alien to the democratic culture of Europe. On the one hand, you have very strong uh, opinion poll support for um, uh, European membership in Poland and in Hungary. But on the other hand, these are regimes, these are countries led by regimes who live by um, sustaining conflict with uh, Brussels. And the model that they are uh, now exporting to the world, conservative, Catholic, Christian, anti-gay, anti-liberal, anti-constitutional at the, at the limit, uh, against uh, uh, counter-majoritarian balances which make a liberal democracy liberal, seem to be now to have um, uh, a global reach that I think ought to be of concern to everybody um, listening to me uh, today. It just says something that we've always known, which is democracy is fragile. Democracy is not a stable, irrevocable achievement in, on the European landmass. Um, this is a vision of democracy, majority rule backing a single party state that um, could have a long life in Europe and a sinister life. And I do hope that uh, I've done a little bit to awaken you to the dimensions of the challenge. And I'm looking at my watch. I think I've done about um, 15, 20 minutes and I, I'll stop there in the hope that we, we can have a great discussion and thank you for, for your attention. Thank you very much indeed, Michael. Um, I have some questions that are coming in, but if I could indulge my position firstly to ask you, um, given what has happened to the opposition in Hungary recently, uh, that they have finally, it seems, managed to overcome the fragmentation and the divisions, and we now have a more or less unified opposition going into an election for the first time since 2010. Does that make it likely that even if the election is free but unfair uh, and Orban comes under pressure, um, how likely is it, first of all, that the opposition can win? If we put aside the question of how uh, Orban and his acolytes react. Um, how likely is it that we might see the end of Fidesz as the governing party in Hungary? Great question, John. And I, I, I love being placed in a position where I become an expert on Hungarian politics. If there's a Hungarian watching this, they're tearing their hair out. And quite rightly, what the hell does this Canadian know about my country? But I, I, you know, I am married to a Hungarian. I've lived there a while and I I'm passionately engaged in, in it. Look, I think there is a chance they can win. I, I don't think there's any doubt. They, they're they united in ways that the opposition that they haven't been for a decade. They have a rather conservative candidate who has the credibility of having, you know, dislodged Fidesz from one, it's one of its fiefdoms in a small town. Um, he's had the guts to go at uh, Fidesz head to head in, 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 a, in, in provincial Hungary. Um, he has been smart in bringing people together. The uh, opposition politicians in Budapest have lined up behind him. So that's pretty good. I, I think this audience needs to understand that uh, according to the political scientists I talk to, 
uh, the opposition has to win by five clear percentage points of the popular vote in order to get a bare majority in parliament. This is because the system is gerrymandered against them. So they have to win big or they're not going to win at all. That's problem number one. Problem number two is that the constitution is so gerrymandered now that you have to have a two thirds majority to do anything substantial. And the opposition is seriously tempted to if they win the election to alter the constitution in order to enable them to pass the legislation they want. And here's the risk. If they do that and alter the constitution, then Orban would, having lost the election, would suddenly take to the streets and say, this is a threat to democracy. You know, you're doing what you accuse me of doing. So, and he has gone to the streets before when he was in opposition, he could do so again. And there is some worry that the transition here, even if he accepts defeat, could be extremely rocky and difficult. And so I'm, I'm aware that there are discussions in the opposition at the moment, how to meet this challenge prudently. And I hope they will meet it uh, uh, prudently. Um, so it's not just it's not just a question of will he give up power peacefully? He might give up power, but then, you know, come back later with a, essentially an extra constitutional challenge to the new government led from the streets. And any politics that ends up in the streets is frankly dangerous. And uh, Budapest 56 was politics in the streets and did not, it was not a pretty sight. So I think we all ought to be concerned about that and pray that both sides in this show the wisdom to keep this in, within constitutional paths. Um, a second question from Alexander Conway, who is a researcher at the Institute, um, reminding us that this morning, Germany formally said goodbye to Angela Merkel. Um, Chancellor Schultz has been sworn in. Alexander asks whether Professor Ignatieff agrees with the view of Matthias, Matthias and Dan Kellerman in a recent piece in Foreign Policy, which essentially argues that Merkel and Germany enabled the developing autocracies of Orban and Kaczynski um, over that period since 2010, in the case of Orban 2015, and in the case of PIS in Poland. So does he think that the end of the Merkel era and the advent of a new SPD-led coalition in Berlin will change the fundamentals in the German-Hungarian relationship in particular and the EU's approach to both Hungary and Poland? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. I think there's no doubt that she enabled. I think what I would say is that she unwillingly enabled. And here's why she enabled, enabled uh, these regimes. I think first in the interest of stability. Uh, second, um, uh, I think there's no question that German industry has really substantial interests in, in um, Hungary, the, the car business. Uh, they use Hungary and Poland, as a, particularly Hungary, as low wage assembly platforms. And so there's substantial German interests telling Merkel just don't don't tip this over. But there's something more fundamental than that, uh, which I learned because um, I went during the CU crisis, I went to Berlin, I talked to uh, Merkel's people, I talked to the president of the Republic, I talked to everybody. Uh, and, and what you slowly begin to understand is Germany's extreme reluctance to uh, bang the table and become the, the bad cop for, for Europe. And then you understand a second thing, which is that nobody in Europe wants to be told what to do by Berlin. I learned that in Copenhagen, actually, because I remembered uh, thinking I was making a kind of clever remark. I said, you know, I, I, when, when people ask me, how, how, how do I think the CU matter could be peacefully resolved? I say, I imagine a conversation in which Angie and Emmanuel pick up the phone on Friday afternoon and say, Victor, we. I got Angie on the line here and we're looking at the Euro budget and there's a $4 billion number uh, on <laughs> structural subsidies here. And, you know, Victor, it's really tough for us, you know, to, to, to sign off on this because our, 
our, our own domestic publics are screaming at us, of, why are we giving all this money to these corrupt guys in Eastern Europe? And um, so Emmanuel and I agree that there's some low hanging fruit here, Victor, which would be really helpful. You know, this little university, just take it off the list and, and you know, sign up to the European public prosecutor, a few other little low hanging fruit, and you'll get your 4 million. But if you don't, Victor, it's, we're gonna, it's gonna be zero, okay? Have a nice weekend. We'll call you Monday, right? I told this in Copenhagen, there was a chilly silence, which made me realize that what the Danes were thinking was, God almighty, if Berlin does that to Budapest, they could do that to Copenhagen. So this tells you something about the fundamental architecture of the European project, which is that it is a union of sovereign states. And in the final analysis, this is not a union that is going to push the sovereign prerogatives of a member state in any serious way. And it's not just Berlin, in other words, it's, it's, the, it's the whole construction. And given Brexit, that tendency to be risk averse and avoid infringing on sovereign prerogatives is much more reinforced. So I don't think it's a matter of Merkel's term temperament. I think it's partly a matter of German reluctance, but it's about the fundamental architecture of this thing that you guys have signed up, up in and done such a good job. I mean, you've used uh, Ireland as the classic example of a small country that's used Europe to massively leverage its international influence. It's been nothing but a positive uh, relationship for you, but it's not the same way for other, uh, other nation states in Europe. And I see no way in which that structural dimension is, is actually going to change. Um, so I think there's going to be a kind of messy, unpleasant little fudge on rule of law stuff. And I think that Europe will simply decide different strokes for different folks. It's the only way to keep this bicycle moving. They'll have illiberal democracy, you know, to the east of uh, you know, Switzerland, and they'll have liberal democracy to the west, and that's the best we can do. And I think that's ultimately going to be very destructive of the European project. And let me tell you one further reason why, which is that I mentioned this business about the Chinese bringing the Fudan University into Budapest. That tells me that one of the, the ideas we've had about the European architecture is where else are they going to go, right? You know, you know, there's only one game in town and that's west to Brussels and to Europe. Well, not necessarily anymore. Uh, China is a very significant player in this part of the world. It could become increasingly important. And, and I, I can imagine a scenario when it, in which under sufficient pressure, Orban Kaczynski and some other future guy would say, I don't need you guys. I've got belt and braces or whatever it's called. I've got these long-term loans. Um, China is good for me. And, and the one thing about China is they don't give me a lecture what kind of domestic regime I run. So I'm just saying this is a very much more unstable uh, 21st century environment than I think we're used to. I'm sorry to go on so long about the question, but it's such a good one. And it's absolutely the key to the whole, whole issue. It, it also prompts me to ask about your own experience as rector of CEU in your engagement with Brussels. Um, there has been deep criticism from academic lawyers, especially of the European Commission in the way that it has handled Hungary and Poland, and that the insistence on using dialogue in preference to proper meaty material sanctions uh, is one that has only emboldened the autocrats further. Now, in the case of CEU, Michael, did you feel that you had sufficient support from the commission in particular? Well, you know, I met all these guys and all these people, you know, you, you couldn't go into Yurova's office and she, without her saying how much she believed in academic freedom and some of these other folks, we met uh, a lot of senior officials. I, I was never short of rhetorical support. Everybody understood instantly that, you know, it was unconscionable that in a Europe of free peoples, a member state could actually expel a university from its from its uh, borders. That's the kind of thing Lukashenko did with a university, but you know Lukashenko's Lukashenko, right? So 
they understood it wasn't and it wasn't that they thought it was a marginal issue they thought it went to the heart of european uh, values but the commission um uh the commission's chief instrument as your lawyers are saying is legal um you know they they prepared the uh legal briefs to the european court of justice that found in our favor but the court found in our favor in a two and a half years you know after we've been thrown out so justice delayed in this case is justice denied and so this recourse to legalism um, is is one source of weakness the other source is the law itself is weak i think uh, irish folks need to understand that there, there isn't good law defending academic freedom and institutional autonomy in Europe. There just isn't. There's a lot of treaty, there's a lot of commercial law. The reason we won the case at, at, um, uh, at the European Court of Justice is that we were we won on the basis that we're a commercial enterprise that you know was our commercial rights were violated. It had nothing to do with academic freedom. And 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 that indicates that a the resort to legalism is limited. Secondly, the legal the law you've got is inadequate. And third, the commission can't do kind of heavy politics. That's for the council. And when the council gets down, it's a bunch of politicians from member states who want an easy life and have got a short term. Let me get through the six months of my pre pre presidency and we can we we can push it along. Um, and, uh, and, you know, in that setting, Orban is one of the most experienced politicians there is. With the departure of, or, or, or the departure of Merkel, he may be, in fact, the most senior politician at the table. He plays the game like a, you know, like a master. They think this guy is a, this guy is, a bad guy, but he's our guy. You know, he knows all the jokes. He remembers our name. He pats our backs. He, you know, and and he's a extremely able politician. So he punches way about his weight. And for that, and, and these are some of the reasons why the hammer never comes down. And in my view, the hammer will never come down on this guy. <clears throat> and ultimately, what I think. And it's a general rule for Europe is when Europe is faced with authoritarian single party rule, the only solution is democratic change from within. There's, there's absolutely nothing from the outside that in the end of the day matters a damn. Um, and I learned that to my, my cost. I, I thought that European institutions put sufficient pressure, formal and informal, to save the institution. No way, no, no, no way at all. The only thing that will prevent, will restore democracy in Hungary and in Poland are the actions of Hungarians and the actions of Poles. And that's probably the way it should be. Yeah. And could you foresee a situation, Michael, where CEU actually returns substantially to Budapest in the future? If we have a new government, new dispensation in Hungary, could you see that kind of uh, return taking place? I think it's unlikely. Um, I well, let me be more precise. We will always have a presence in Budapest. We have a presence now. Um, we have a campus. We have a library. We have a democracy institute, um, and we will maintain that. What I don't think we'll do is any situation in which our accreditation depends on the whims of a of a Hungarian government, even one in the hands of the opposition. Um, because I simply don't have confidence in the in the autonomy of the accrediting institutions that we would be required to 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 work with. Whereas in Austria, you know, it's a it's a classic European state where those things nobody puts their political thumb on the on the on the counter. Um, so we will stay in Budapest, but the core of our teaching operation, I think, will be in Vienna forever. And the other thing is that Vienna is a is a terrific international center of learning and study. So it's it's very good. It's very positive for us. Yeah, um, we have a question here from Pat Kelly from the Department of Foreign Affairs, who thanks Hi, you. Pat. 
kind comments earlier. Michael asks, given the EU's post-2004 experience of accommodating new members such as Hungary and Poland, do you think the EU should be cautious about further enlargement into the Western Balkans? Or should we still see this as a necessary step to promote stability, reconciliation and reform in a region which is still strategically important to Europe? Boy, Pat's asked a great question and I, I'm, I'm very much of two minds. Um, on the political side, there is zero appetite for enlargement among the existing electorates of the 27, and that's just a fact. Um, on the other side, it's clear that unless the Western Balkans gets a political destination, uh, they're going to go in some very weird directions, and we already see that um, they're going in weird directions. Um, and it's not merely that they'll go in weird directions, but a kind of vacuum will emerge in which the Chinese, the Russians, and the Turks, above all, will begin to, you know, create their clients of, of influence and interest. And that is not good for the long-term stability of, of Southern, Southern Europe. So um, at the moment, the game, <clears throat> the game that Europe is playing is, Yes, but not now, uh, holding the, the, the bright, shiny bauble of eventual enlargement to keep these places politically stabilized. But I, I just don't know how long this can be, uh, this can be done. Um, and and the, the trouble with enlargement, if you just take a place like Serbia, Serbia is a terrific place. I, I, you know, I, Yugoslav war is a part, you know, part beside, you know, some wonderful people there, but it's, 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 it's another single party state. It, it's, it's, it's not a great regime to negotiate with. So enlargement would, would have to be very demanding uh, of, uh, of Serbia, it would have to be very demanding of these other regimes. They would have to really um, meet some pretty difficult tests on corruption, on democratic legitimacy. And I, I just think they're nowhere near that at the moment. And, and, and they can't come in until they've cleared those bars. So I, I, I think the positive side is to do everything that the EU can to in, improve the free market in goods, improvement in infrastructure, um, maybe some visa liberalization to, to get some of these huge volumes of unemployed people who are just dying to, to work in Europe, get them in and get them coming in and out on a, on, a, on, a, on a sort of guest worker basis. I think there's a lot that Europe can do um, because, um, you know, I, I cut my teeth on the Balkan Wars in the 90s and was there for nearly a decade. And it was terrible for Europe to have, <laughs> it was terrible for everybody for have so many people massacred and killed and deported in that period. It's a, it's a scarring uh, memory for Europe and a shameful one. This was supposed to, we remember the year, this was supposed to be you know, Europe's job, they couldn't do it. Um, I think Europe can now set out a, a roadmap in which infrastructure investment, uh, people investment, institutional reform, don't take the possibility of enlargement off the table, but make it clear this is not going to happen until these regimes genuinely and irrevocably liberalize. That gives them some perspective, um, but pretending it's not happening, pretending it'll just go away if you ignore it is a recipe for disaster. I think one of the reasons that your book, Blood and Belonging, still resonates so much is that there is still deep a fragility about Bosnia with the secessionist threats from Republika Srpska. Recent yeah. events in Montenegro demonstrate the tensions within that polity and Kosovo Serbia remains a very, very difficult relationship as well. Yeah. Um, I have another question from Francis Jacobs, who is the former head of the European Parliament representation in Ireland and a member of the Institute. Francis asks, apart from the opposition parties, what other countervailing forces 
might we point to in Hungary and in Poland? How strong is civil society? And what are the views of younger Hungarians and Poles mm -hmm. and of their diasporas? And will those matter in creating change in the years ahead? Oh. That's another great question. My sense is that um, civil society in Hungary is not as strong as we would like it to be. It's very dependent on external support. I know this because the Open Society Foundation, on which I used to sit as a board, did a lot of funding. It was very difficult because the minute you took OSF money, you were, you know, a George Soros puppet, you know, this kind of stuff. Um, but the very need for external support in indicates a certain fragility in the civil society uh, composition. The other factor in all this region is, is, is out migration. I mean, <clears throat> you don't stay in Hungary if, you, if you're unhappy or discontented or opposed to the regime. You just get on a train and go to Vienna or Dusseldorf or you know, Dublin even. Um, and and this is an, a, a, a perverse aspect of EU enlargement that I don't think we anticipated, which is that it it's a kind of safety valve for these single party regimes. If you don't like the place you leave, and so five, six hundred thousand Hungarians live in other parts of Europe, they remit income back, but they come back to see their mums and dads in the summer. Uh, but their political force inside the country is is um, uh, much is not is not terribly strong, although they do vote and and the external vote will be important in the next election. Some of the same thing is also true in Poland, which has huge out migration, um, and and I think that's um, that's uh, weak. The other the other thing to say, which which I think is a, a sort of point about social science. Um, Whenever you use the word civil society, you always assume that civil society is somehow progressive. Uh, one of my colleagues, um, Bela Greshkovich at the university has made the point, which I think is extremely important. There's a right wing civil society. There's a conservative civil society. And it may be that the conservative civil society in Hungary and in Poland is much stronger than the liberal or progressive one. The, the civil society that's strong in Hungary is the church and it's been massively aided in Hungary by the Orban regime. Ditto, obviously, in, in Poland. The massive uh, moral, political, emotional power of the Catholic Church is always to be respected, but it's mostly pro-regime, uh, pro uh, just as it was you know, courageously, heroically anti-communist in, in, in a previous period. So uh, there is a civil society, but it's not necessarily on the side of you know, progressive liberalism, it's, it, you know, uh, and, and I, you know, I think um, one of the enormous strengths of Polish society is the Catholic Church. I'm not, I'm not a believer, but you just have to respect the immense moral prestige of this institution and hope that over time it will play a role in, in um, orienting Poland on a good path. Um, I have another question from Dan O'Brien of the Institute. Dan asks, would non-acceptance of an election outcome by a member state be a red line for the European Union and bring the very membership of Hungary into question? I think that's a terrific point, and I hope to hell you're right. I absolutely agree. That is, if there, that's a red line. And Europe would have to, the Council of Ministers would have to say that unequivocally. You lost, goodbye. Uh, don't show up to the next meeting on Tuesday. Uh, you're done, we're working with the other guys. So this would be a case where Europe could suddenly play a very productive role in assisting a democratic tr transition simply by refusing to validate uh, any form of opposition to a certified result. I think that's a very important point, and I hope, I hope Europe will play that role. And I certainly hope that any Irish diplomats or officials listening to this will file that away in their in in the back of their mind, because I think that is that could be coming at us 
in, uh, in May 2022. Um, connected to this, Connor Daly, who is a research fellow at Trinity College, asks about the mechanics of the election potentially. And he asks what risk that Orban will borrow some of the very successful techniques employed by Putin's acolytes, for example, in their managed democracy in Russia, things like the exclusion of opposition candidates from participating in the election on trumped up grounds, falsification of election counts, ballot stuffing, the intimidation of state employees. Do you see evidence that things like that are in the offing, Michael? Um, particularly the last one, uh, there's a very large public sector. It's highly politicized, very much under the control. You know, school teachers, you know, uh, primary school teachers. In the previous election in 2018, there was some evidence that, you know, people were told pretty clearly by their school principals, you know, hey, you, you know what side your bread is buttered on and who butters it for you. So don't do some stupid of the polls. I think there's quite a lot of that very old traditional stuff, which you've seen in lots of countries, not just in Eastern Europe. I think the other element, uh, yes, I think they will reach into the Russian playbook, but I think it's important to remember how globalized modern politics is. I mean, the, the 2018 Orban campaign was run by a conservative Republican um, spin doctor in New York. It was he uh, who decided, let's make the whole campaign to be about George Soros, for example. He was the one who, who gave Orban his, his electoral playbook. So these regimes are very, very sophisticated in their use of social media, in their use of campaign advertising, in their use of, uh, of attack ads. The entire playbook of Western politics that I knew when I was in politics is, is, is fully on display. These places are not little provinces. They, they are plugged into the latest black arts of with the advantage that they can also make use of the black arts of the Russians. So I think it'll all be in play, uh, but I think there's a limit to how effective it can be because these, these techniques have been used for 10 years now. People are kind of, there's a saturation effect. And as much as anything, it's the fact that he's simply been in power for 11 years and people get fed up and tired of it. Uh, and um, uh, so, I don't want to overdo this. I, I think he could still win. I, I think there's no question. It's going to be very, very close. Um, and uh, at the moment, it seems to me that the opposition has the best chance in a decade. But that's about all I would say. Um, just on the question of terminology, the um, phrase illiberal democracy, I just wanted to ask you briefly to perhaps unpack this. Um, is, is there a risk that when we use that term, we kind of play on Orban's terrain because it presents this model as simply another uh, type of uh, democratic uh, structure and that it has just as much legitimacy as the Canadian one or the Irish one. The Russians, as I say, referred to their model as a managed democracy. Um, what we're really talking about here is surely autocracy and authoritarianism of a very familiar kind. I think that's absolutely right. Um, Janos Kish, a wonderful political philosopher in Hungary, who's a colleague and friend, says we shouldn't be using a liberal democracy. It's, it, it's intrinsically a contradiction in terms. And your second point, which is we shouldn't play on his terrain. And when you use his lingo you're doing so. I, I think that's I think that's right. The the prop the, the reason that I cling to it a little bit is the enormous importance of democratic legitimacy to everything that Orban has done. Every time he's in a jam with Brussels, with liberal opponents like me, with our, he says, listen, I won three damn elections. You know, don't I I went out and won them fair and square. I have the confidence of the Hungarian people. You do not. You do not represent anybody. The, the attack on Soros is an attack based on democratic legitimacy. Who the hell are you, New York financier? What, 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 
Who do you, how many votes do you have? You know, so I, I, I agree with the point you're making, John. I think it's, it's fundamental, but you don't, if you simply call him another kind of authoritarian, you're missing the crucial role of an idea of democracy in that's in his head and as in the heads of the of the Hungarian people. He has very deep support because people say he hears me, he listens to me, he understands me. Um, he's the one who bumps my pension up every January. You know, I mean, it's and 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 so uh, it is a kind of democracy. <laughs> That's the problem, uh, and um, uh, and I think you you see this in the United States. This is where this is where this is this recurrent uh, uh, uprising in American political traditions against the counter majoritarian elements of their own constitution is a very enduring feature of American democracy. And it, 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 it's not quite right to simply say these are just authoritarian populists. No, these people are claiming they are Democrats, just not your kind of Democrats. And, and that's why I think um, I, I, I unwillingly use illiberal democracy while I concede the, the very good point you're making. Thank you. Um, we are drawing towards the end of our session here. I have one final question from our colleague, Dr. Balish Apoor, who is Professor of European Studies at Trinity College Dublin. And Balash asks, what do you think the leeway of the Hungarian opposition would be in the sphere of higher education after the recent changes in the status of universities in Hungary, which, as Balash points out, essentially brings them under the control of the government. It wasn't just CEU that was attacked, of course, it was the Hungarian Academy of Sciences and others. So what might the Hungarian higher education landscape look like, do you think, in a post-Fidesz age? Will it be difficult to sort of bring it back to the position it was in previously? Well, there's a great deal of discussion everywhere in Hungary about whether some of the changes instituted by Fidesz are irreversible. Um, and, and that will be a challenge for the regime. You know, public assets have been passed into private hands and property law makes it very difficult to unstitch that. That would be one example. I think it's easier in the case of higher education to unstitch some of this stuff and hand it back um, but clearly, Hungary is going to need an entirely new institutional architecture to reestablish the uh, autonomy of these institutions. It is, let's be clear, a state-funded system, so it's going to be autonomy within the con constraints of a, of a state budget. The particular thing that I think Balash is referring to is that many of these universities have now been essentially privatized and given um, access to state assets like the revenues from the, from the uh, public uh, oil company. Um, I, I can see a way in which you could keep that going, but you get it under some kind of new statute that makes it accessible to public and democratic control. The real issue is that the um, the boards of trustees that run these institutions are all fit as plans. And one of the temptations for a incoming opposition regime is simply replace the bad guys with your guys. And I think that's an absolute mistake. I think it's gonna be critical for the um, new regime if it succeeds to actually keep some of the, uh, there are plenty of honest people uh, who serve in fit as institutions are, and, and, and they should be deliberately kept to make the point that we want to create a, a Hungary in which uh, these institutions have genuine autonomy from, from power. Now, whether the opposition can resist the temptation to reward their friends and punish their enemies, that's, I think, the key issue in the transition after May 2022, if they win. 
Thank you very much indeed, Michael. We have come up to the hour, so I am reluctantly going to have to bring a fascinating conversation to a close. I want to, on behalf of the Institute, thank you very much indeed for giving you not just our, your time today, but these hugely valuable insights from your own experience and extrapolating from the Hungarian to the European level. So thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you also to the participants who have joined us on this call, almost 100 people I gather at an earlier point. Uh, thank you all very much indeed. Thank you also for the really interesting questions. So again, thanks to our guest speaker, Michael, and see everybody next time. Thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye.